Trefay sets the early pace here. Andrew Bumbolo is also up there. And we'll take a look at the competitors here in the 5,000 meter final. And of course, Galen Rupp sure to get a lift from the crowd as he did in the 10,000 meters. He's one of the local favorites. Here in the 5,000, Mo Trefay continues to lead. Robert Cesaret is in second place. He's Bernard Lagat's younger brother. Brandon Bethke, Andrew Bumbolo, Galen Rupp. Well, no one's ever surprised to see Mo Trefay up front. He likes to lead. He often does that in road races where he's had his most success as a runner. And Bethke was the one people thought might actually push the pace. So not surprising to see the two of them up front. Yeah, it is Trefay and Bethke 1-2 with Cesaret, Bumbolo, Rupp, and Lagat. And of course, also again, the way you have to reach London is to achieve the A standard. And here are the runners in this race that have achieved the A, and it's a short list. And Mo Trefay is in front. The race has tightened considerably since we took that break. Brandon Bethke is still in second place, but no big gap anymore. Bernard Lagat has closed it. He's in third. Then Lopez Lamont, Galen Rupp, Andrew Bumbolo with five laps to go. Ultrafe pushing it a little bit as they uh, enter the turn for the home straightaway. Thank you for joining us today on Go Ed Tech Go. Today we have Mohamed Trafe joining us. Thank you, Mohamed, for taking some time out of your day to join us and uh, help us out with Trainer Champion. Thank you. So, Mohamed, um, I've known you for a long time. I know you since you were 14 um, and I know your journey, but can you kind of tell everybody your journey from, you know, even from before that, how you got into running and then kind of where you are now all the way to MoFit? Yes. So, um, you know, I, I came from a small village in the Atlas Mountains of Morocco and uh, I had a really, really tough childhood because I grew up only with my grandparents. My mother had to work and my uh, father, um, I did not see him for like almost 14 years. And uh, so it was a tough childhood. I grew up uh, very poor, uh, didn't have much. And I was very fortunate and lucky to be able to, to migrate to the United States. So, uh, and we paid a big price because I didn't see my mom for five years. He came here in 94, then I was nine. And then five years later, uh, I, I came to, uh, to California. And at that time, at the age of 14, I did not speak the language uh, in eighth grade. And I had, I had difficulty um, adapting to the, to the culture, to the lifestyle. You know, the way I dressed was funny, was different. Uh, I, you know, um, I, didn't, I didn't have uh, friends. And uh, I met a, a, a friend, his name was Jason Garcia. And I used to walk with him to school. Because that he was like my uh, kind of like my protector, you know, like because I used to get bullied, you know, and so I would be next to him like during uh, lunchtime, and I when we finished school, I walk with him to the to the uh, because he lived around the corner, and one day we uh, he walked to the to the track, and that's when I met uh, Coach uh, Gomez, and I was so happy because uh, I thought. You know, I believe that I was a good runner, but even though I never ran like three miles straight, I just thought I was a good runner. And I told coach, I don't think he remembers this, but I told him, hey, I'm a good runner. I'm fast. I think I can win tomorrow. <laughs> I mean, I was humble and shy, but when I got there to track, I was like, you know what? I think I can win tomorrow. So the next day, uh, it was my, uh, I, got, I went to the doctor to get cleared. Next day, I got beat by all the boys and I got beat by the girls. And uh, and then Coach Gomez he said, you know what, uh, you have to uh, you have to train really hard to be a good runner. You know, it it does not come easy. And even during practice, uh, a lot of times, because I was impatient in my nature, I'm always impatient. Uh, I used to train very hard every day, every day, every day. And Coach Gomez used to tell me, uh, uh, Mo, some days you actually have to go slow. When you're doing a long run, you don't have to go fast. You can just go very slow and long. So he started giving me like uh, little tips, you know, uh, about training. And uh, he gave me my first book. Uh, pre, it was called Prefontaine. It was the book about Steve Prefontaine, uh, an American legend, distance runner from Oregon. And that was my first book that I read in my life. And, and that inspired me uh, to be a runner. And another thing that helped was uh, 
doing tr well cross country i did not really show any potential like i was just normal like i was a normal runner uh and i had to battle like some injuries like shin splints and, and such and track season comes and i had a hard time breaking four minutes 50 seconds for the mile so coach gomez and you know i admire coach gomez for uh, for this because he knew how to uh, motivate the, the kids and how to inspire them uh, he gave me uh, a Nike watch to use in training. He gave me my first spikes. Um, and uh, he made a deal with me. He said, look, Mo, if you break four minutes and 40 seconds for the mile, I'll buy you a Letterman jacket. <laughs> and, uh, and I only had one chance, and it was league finals. And I ended up running four minutes, 34 seconds. And that's, that's when we knew that, you know, uh, I had, you know, special talents and, and that I could, do something special uh, in the future now um the following you know following year uh, i was able to win league championships following year league meets or league championships were not a big deal like we used them for training but by sophomore year it was clear that you know my competition was state level not league level of cif it was mostly like in the states i had to compete against the best uh, runners in the states and another thing that Coach Gomez did well was he took me uh, to my first road race. I don't I don't remember my time. I ran I ran a 10k as a sophomore, uh, uh, which was nice. And then and then he took me to an open meet to race against a college runner. Uh, I forgot his last name. Uh, Pina. His last name was Pina, something like that. And uh, I ran 14 minutes and 38 seconds for the 5,000 meters. But really, the guy who was a college runner. He was like 20 something years old. He was on my back the whole race to the last 100 meters. Uh, and, and he passed and he beat me. And uh, I started to get to get uh, a lot of attention, you know, in, uh, locally, you know, from the city. Uh, you know, me and coach, we went to get uh, honored by the city, by the mayor of the city of Duwari, uh, and which was for me was huge. And that's when I took running more seriously. Um, seriously and uh, as a junior uh, things start to get better and better i finished number seventh uh, at Foot Locker nationals um and then as a senior i did not have a great cross country season because i was fasting uh, ramadan i was burned out and i finished number 11th uh, in cross country and i ran some really good times um uh, i ran three minutes 49 seconds for the for the 1500 153 for the uh, 800 and then 29 minutes 54 seconds for the 10,000 meters, which, which was special because uh, no high school runner uh, ran that time in 34 years, and that made a big deal. And um, another thing that I did not mention was uh, uh, Coach Gomez used to joke, "When are you gonna come check out these letters that we were getting from the universities?" Because he had like a huge box full of letters uh, of schools that wanted to uh, recruit me. Uh, to run with them and every day uh, he shared my contact information and every day when I get home I get phone calls from like coaches uh, across the country hey this is coach such and such from Arkansas from Princeton from uh, uh, Arizona Arizona State UCLA USC and um, so that it was very very special and it gave me a lot of confidence in myself you know coming to the US uh, leaving my my family behind my friends I had to start from scratch and I was a little bit kind of depressed. I never knew what depression was, but I did have some little depression uh, because I had to leave my grandparents and they raised me. Um, but running kind of like filled that gap. And it, it was a, it, for me, it was a way to express my, uh, my talents and also to, uh, to, uh, to meet new people and to connect with the coach because I didn't have friends at, at the school. And, the coaches were my friends, you know, my, my teammates were my friends. I went to Arizona for two years and then I decided to uh, uh, to become an elite athlete. Um, I, I should not say I became a professional athlete because I was not sponsored. But uh, two years down the road, uh, Nike picked me up uh, and uh, I got a sponsorship from, uh, from Nike. And they were willing to pay for my plane ticket and for my hotel. And this was the first time that I got a race to pay for my hotel room and for my plane ticket. And guess what? I broke the course record. I ran one hour and two minutes in the race just because I had that peace of mind. 
and it's no magic to be honest you cannot run fast when you're not happy and guess what the same week i'm getting phone calls from the, from across the country from USAT at USA Track and Field, we want you to go to the World Championships with us. Uh, I'm getting uh, fo- getting phone calls from the uh, race director. Come and run our race, national championship competitions. Uh, I'm getting uh, offers from like running stores to come and work for them and get a free place to stay and the car and food and all that stuff just to work for them for like a month. And and then I, I competed, and that year I finished number uh, number two in a national championship. Um, in the 20k and i won a couple of races tell tell us a little bit because the students have to do something with food like diet right so when you're in a competitive season right what is your prescribed diet like when you're in the top shelf you know top layer of running and you're getting ready for those national championships what does your diet look like okay so um for for someone who runs about 120 miles a week on average uh, to be honest, um, we don't have to stay away from carbohydrates. You know, as an endurance athlete, you know, if someone wants to lose weight, you tell them to stay off the carbs, right? But for us, you know, I eat carbs every meal. You know, you have bread in the morning, you have bread for lunch, or you have pasta for dinner, or rice, or quinoa, or you know, anything that or potatoes, anything that has carbs, we eat it. Now, um, you got. I also, I always had almonds. Uh, pecans, uh, walnuts, dates, and figs with me nonstop throughout my whole career. Figs, dates, almonds, pecans, and walnuts. Nonstop. I always have them. That's my snack. Now, as far as fruits, I mean, I eat all the fruits, you know, seasonal fruits, grapes, strawberries, you know, watermelon, anything. You know, it's not a, it's not a, you can eat, we, we, I'm able to eat any fruit I like. I don't have to stay away from the fruits because the fruits actually give me a lot of good uh, enzymes. It gives me a lot of good electrolytes, the B12, um, you know, um, good uh, minerals as well, potassium, magnesium. And also, uh, as far as the vegetables, I used to have vegetables like either vegetables or, or, uh, or greens in every meal, like lunch or dinner. I always have either greens or vegetables with carbs and protein. And I used to have at least about 300 grams of protein per meal. And then I have extra protein uh, for uh, when I snack on, on the almonds and the pecans and, and all that. Now, um, now in the off season, uh, like when I take like three weeks off or one month off a year, you know, sometimes I don't take that much. But actually, I try to get fat during the off season. You know, I try to gain some weight. You know, um, I get like... I try to get a little chubby face and, uh, um, you know, I might gain like five or 10 pounds during the off season, but during the off season, I eat everything. Like that's when I, uh, uh, I eat uh, the ice cream and, you know, I just, you know, I enjoy my life because when, it, when training gets serious, you, you're not going to do your, uh, your uh, repeats and you have a race in a month and you, you, you go out and, and order some ice cream because you're going to get sick. Right. So as athletes or endurance athletes, we are very fragile because we put our bodies through a lot of stress, you know, in training. And you can easily hurt yourself. You cannot go up and ski up uh, in Mammoth. Uh, You cannot play basketball. You might twist your ankle. And also you cannot like drink really cold drinks or eat ice cream because you might might actually get sick. Um, So... uh, uh, I was very careful when it came to uh, to nutrition and also taking care of uh, my body uh, during the season before competitions. In that same uh, light, Mo, um, you talked in detail about your diet. That's like a big key thing that our students have to address for their clients is the right diet for their, um, you know, the client's desired goal. But right. in addition to diet, you know, from your experience, you kind of talked about it quite a bit, a little bit. Um, is that as a an elite runner, right? Like you were saying, what are some of the areas that your trainers, right? When you got to that high level, what were some of the areas your trainers, what do they want to focus on for you during your training? What were they, what were their focuses? As far as training, um, you know, um, I break down um, training to different phases. Now, 
um, during the during the, the adapt there's always an adaptation phase where uh, you're letting your body adapt to the training because you're coming you start you're starting training always from scratch, correct? And so the training at that time we focus mostly on endurance, uh, slow running. We don't have to go. We don't. We, I don't even look at the watch how fast I ran, or um, you know, uh, or how many miles I usually run by time. So like very relaxed running, no pressure. So for example, the first uh, uh, four four weeks of the training program, you know, you start with 30 minutes run, 35 minutes, 40 minutes, and build to, to where you, you're able to run one hour. Of course, you can run more more than that, but you have to. We have to be smart not to to burn out uh, the body. So in adaptation, it's very very um a sensitive it's a sensitive time where you cannot uh you know play with the red zone you know um so so there's the adaptation phase and then there's a phase where you uh with preparation and that's where um you you start counting your mileage you, you take your uh, training log and uh, uh you make sure you hit in certain mileage every single week now now also during that preparation phase you work on your strengthening you know all the weaknesses you work on your uh, uh on your uh, on your legs uh quads hamstring calves hips um uh, upper body uh core flexibility we work on all of that during the during the preparation phase and we also uh focus mainly on mileage and long repetitions to build that uh, uh Lactate, lactate threshold and endurance for that will help us do the quality training later in the in the season. Now, after like uh, about eight to twelve weeks of the preparation phase, and when you load and load all those mileage every week, 100, 110, 120, now you back off. You start to drop the mileage so you can focus on your specific events. So let's say if I am preparing for a half marathon championship. What I'm going to do now is I'm not going to do um, smooth training or uh, weightlifting because I, I, I lift weights, you know, during the preparation three times a week and I train twice a day. Now, I'm going to only do weights only once a week. Well, guess what? The other strength train I'm going to use now is hill repeats. So now the, with the hill repeats, let's say you do, you go to a point where you're running 20 times, 300 meters uphill and then you jog back and you're running at a pace very close to your uh, race pace for the half marathon. So now we're preparing all those tendons and muscles to be prepared for the intensity that's going to come later again in the season. So that way you don't get injured. Uh, and then and then you start doing your mile repeat. You're doing, uh, you're, uh, you introduce speed training. Now, later in the season, we have only six weeks to the race. Well, guess what? No more heel repeat and no more strength training. So that way your body can recover and you're able to get some turnover. So that's where we start focusing on workouts specific to the event. Whether you're running a mile, uh, the half marathon, a marathon, that's when you start focusing uh, on your specific event. Uh, whether you're trying to do track, you put on your spikes and you start, you know, you start uh, doing uh, high intensity workouts, uh, at race pace uh, with the spikes, uh, your speed workouts. Um, and uh, you focus on recovery and your runs become easy runs. They're not, they're, no more you're looking for endurance. You already have all that endurance. So you're easy, you're, 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 the days that you, uh, you don't do a speed workout or like a specific workout for the event, you're actually just jogging easy. And I used to see when I was training at a high level, I used to have women with like their babies on a stroller pass by me when I'm doing my, rec my, my recovery run, you know? When I do a hard workout today, tomorrow, I'm going to have a, a pregnant woman pass, pass by me jogging. And she doesn't know that I just won a USA championship, you know? So <laughs> I'm like, oh, you know, she just passed by me while I let her. You know, I'm not going to compete with a pregnant woman, you know, <laughs> or uh, a woman with a stroller, you know? So um, so the, the, the training, uh, it, it's broken down to different phases. And the phases can could be uh, either two or three or four phases depending on how much time you have to prepare for that competition. Now, if you only have 12 weeks, why are you going to try to try to uh, rush everything, you know, which I don't, I don't uh, recommend. How do you yeah. deal with 
hydration during those times because you're talking about running you know 15 20 miles maybe in a in a, in a day how yeah. do you deal with that during a race and then how do you deal with it kind of during uh your training sessions yeah so as far as hydration um you know when i was training very seriously and it's funny i you know uh like a wa water bottle used to be next to my head the whole time whether i'm watching tv or i'm laying down between my uh workouts relaxing i always had my water right next to me um and hydration was very very important not only hydration as far as drinking water of course you have to drink uh, um, plenty of water you might have to drink uh, uh, in liters at least three four liters five liters, three to four liters even five a day because you're sweating a lot you're able to drink more you know uh, you're losing all this water so you have to uh, you have to refill your body with, with that uh, with that water um also uh, as far as hydration uh, fruits help with hydration if you're eating like watery fruits like watermelon uh grapes stuff like that they uh, they help with hydration and also sports drinks and um so you you know as an athlete whether you play basketball or run or baseball you need, you need to hydrate also with uh with sports drinks when you are actually in training or after your workout uh drinks that have plenty of minerals uh potassium magnesium sodium um maybe maybe it might have some amino acids in it as well to help uh, uh recover uh the muscles um uh, as you as you already know you know when you're training the muscle cells break down and we gotta get those muscle cells re uh, to recover and to rebuild so uh, a lot of sports drinks um um must have the the glutamine some amino acids and the electrolytes and uh and minerals um now during competitions um if you miss your drink let's say if you're running a marathon and you miss your drink or you forget to take the right the right uh, hyd uh, hydration you know sports drink it will cause you a race and, and that happened to me a couple of times where I, I, because I did not, I did not like drinking during the race. Imagine you're running and you have to drink at the same time. I did not like it. Uh, I used to, uh, it was, I was not, I was not comfortable with that. And so I say, you know what? I'm just passing the half marathon, half marathon mark. Uh, uh, you know, I still feel fine. I feel fine. I think I'm okay. You know, I, I don't have to drink. You know, I'm, I'm okay. Or I'll just take a small sip and throw the bottle. Um, and guess what? Five miles later your hamstring is tight your hamstring is getting tight and you know and uh, you cannot run, you cannot move anymore uh, so hydration plays a big part that's really good <clears throat> i know you talked about um the training regimen as well and you know everything ties into it diet uh, hydration to kind of get prepared for that but when you kind of start you, know, you talked about it kind of in seasons right like you would go through the season and start the next season um at the beginning Right, beginning the training season, what kind, uh, what kind of baseline tests do they do to kind of check your progress during the training? I have a business here in the U.S. and also in uh, in Morocco, and I have hired over 25 coaches uh, to work for my company. And what I do during the assessment is I do BMI and body fat percentage testing. Um, and once I check the BMI and body fat uh, percentage. If the client is only overweight or uh, at the right weight, now I give them about 1,800 to 2,000 calories um, per, per day, and I just give them a balanced diet where they, you know, the boys just stay away from from the junk food, the um, processed processed foods, and processed sugars. Now, if the client is uh, uh, like, let's say, for example, like 50 pounds overweight, that's when you, we sometimes. Um, we have to cut the calories. I mean, of course, we're doing the training and the strength training and the, and the, and the cardio, so that way they, they can reset their metabolism because their metabolism is, is very, very, very slow. Um, but some, for some people, you have to actually cut some calories for them in order to lose uh, the weight. And I go as low as 1,500 calories for people who need to drop a lot of weight and, uh, and fat. Uh, because some people, if you give them a healthy diet, but you're feeding them 1,800 to 2,000 calories uh, a day, they might not drop the weight. So you're forced to say, okay, I'm going to give you your breakfast, I'm going to give you your lunch, and a couple of snacks, 
but for dinner i'm only gonna give you like uh, this protein uh, protein shake protein smoothie you know so everyone is different and we try to uh, uh, this, uh, specialize every diet for, uh, for every person all of that stuff is important like we're finding out that like in every sport because we've done a bunch of interviews baseball wrestlers whatever um and everybody's dig different and but with you with injury prevention right you're talking about running so many miles so many times your feet hit the ground and pound right so yes what kind of medical professionals when you got to that top level right when you were in the olympic trials you had two olympic trials eight time u.s champion what type of medical professionals were around you to help you with that injury prevention? Correct. Correct. So um, one thing that I uh, that I maintained throughout since 2009 is getting at least two massages a week, uh, two sports massages a week, uh, and uh, getting stretched by uh, my uh, my massage uh, therapist. So I would get stretch. Uh, my, uh, I would stretch my IT band, my hamstring, uh, hips. Um, quad and also deep tissue massage and uh, I, I would also um, uh, you know a few times a year I would go to a doctor in New York uh, his name is Michael Fischitelli and he would work on my uh, alignment so he would uh, he would crack me and he would you know sometimes you know because of all that mileage you know you, uh, sometimes you uh, you need balance in your body sometimes your, uh, your hips are imbalanced or uh, uh, one side is tighter than the other side so he helps me kind of like uh, release those tensions and to rebalance uh, my body. Um, also, um, I, I, I proper warm up was very. I mean, I mean that's the first thing you, you got to start with is proper warm up. I mean, this is something I cannot stress enough. Um, I do that with my. I, I spend 20 minutes with all my clients, just warming up, and I tell them, look, I, I cannot warm you up in five minutes or just stretch you and then you start. 20 minute warm up. Um, and as a professional athlete, I used to spend almost one hour just warming up for my for my workouts. So imagine like jogging for half an hour very easy and you do another 15 minutes of drills and then you do like another 10 minutes of strides and then five minutes of stretching and then you start your workouts. So proper warm up uh, helped me a lot. Uh, maintaining two massages a week uh, and also, um, you know, uh, you know, doing doing about four to six checkups with a chiropractor to uh, to adjust my um, uh, my body, uh, and all, of course, uh, you know, healthy diets and staying hydrated. And you mentioned this kind of a little bit earlier um, when you talked about, especially with diet and everything else, um, and the cost as well. That kind of came up when you talked about the cost of training. Um, but what, if any, for runners, like medications, vitamins, or supplements, do they take during the the regular season, and how does it change during preseason? Off-season, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So for athletes, um, you know, uh, I don't know what everyone is doing, but uh, personally, like, uh, as far as supplements, now during the preseason, because you let's say you're lifting weights, you know, you're doing the long runs and you're lifting weights. Well, guess what? You're going to be consuming more amino acids because you're breaking down those muscle cells, and you need, you need to recover. You know, um, I mean, if we're going to go talk a little bit that what, what a lot of people are doing like in other sports i mean i did not do it personally i swear <laughs> um athletes are taking for example human growth hormones or they're taking testosterone during that that period so they can recover their muscles now um for an endurance athlete i don't need to take testosterone or hormones because i need to stay skinny you know i, I cannot do that it would actually hurt my performance more than it would help my performance so um, a lot of athletes during the preseason, they would use um, amino acids, for example, arginine, uh, glutamine. Arginine for me is, is, is the same as taking like a human growth hormone. I mean, when I wake up the next morning taking arginine, I feel my legs are huge and they're strong and they're, you know, they're powerful, you know. Um, and so you don't really have to take illegal substances, you know, to, 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 uh, to recover. You can take... Uh, good supplements uh, to recover. Um, vitamin C uh, is uh, crucial throughout the whole season, you know, because uh, vitamin C helps you recover and keeps, you know, it helps with your immune system and also helps you get rid of the free radicals, the lactic acid that you build in training. Um, 
uh, now later in the season, um, you're going to start taking maybe, uh, personally, I would take, for example, uh, uh, pre, pre uh, competition or pre workouts. Um, you know, it's not the same pre workouts that a lot of bodybuilders and people who lift weights take. Um, uh, I take, I used to take a pre workout that helped, helped me with my concentration. You know, I, I love the feeling of being focused. Uh, I'm in the zone for my uh, for my uh, uh, workouts and before the competitions. So that's one. And I also took an endurance uh, pre pre workout that helps me with that fight anti fatigue. And 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 these supplements, for example, they have some mineral. They have some minerals. They have some uh, amino acids. They have they have some caffeine, a little caffeine, B12, vitamin C, and it, it works together uh, to help you, uh, you know, with your focus and also to fight off the fatigue uh, in, in, your, in your body. Now also, for example, during the night, um, athletes, a lot of athletes will, will take, for example, ZMA, zinc magnesium um, supplement, and it helps with your, of course, you sleep like a baby, but uh, it helps you get like a deep, very, very deep sleep. Um, and, you know, if you have good sleep, that means your body is recovering, and that's when your hormones are working really, really, uh, really well. Um, multivitamin is very important throughout the whole season as well. Um, but like I said, the only difference is when you get into competition season, you start to take free workouts and also, uh, you gotta make sure to take, uh, supplements for recovery at night, you know, like magnesium or, or, uh, ZMA. So Mo, um, when we talked to you, let's go back a little bit. You talked about a little bit of depression not feeling good right and having the stressors in your life of what it is to get that to get that sponsorship because it's different than being a baseball player where you get drafted and all of a sudden you're signed right you i mean you got to yeah. get a sponsor. so what are some of the normal mental stressors that happen with an elite athlete and then what are some ways that you kind of blow off steam yeah so um you know when you when you're a elite or professional athlete and you don't have a sponsorship um you are always stressed uh, about uh, getting invited to competitions, you know, um, and um, and not having you know the the financial support or the the money to be able to provide uh, for yourself. And many many endurance athletes in our sport in running, um, you know, I, I mean, I have seen some, you know, I and I read about some. They they're not able to afford their own apartment. You know, they might be staying with a friend, or they, maybe they are. They have their roommates, or you might find two guys staying in one room, or stuff like that. The, most elite athletes who are trying to get their sponsorship are actually under the poverty level. <laughs> you know, I, I was personally surviving with like, like six hundred, eight hundred dollars a month, because I, I could only work that much, so that way I can train. Um, now. I always talk to myself and, and dream, you know, I, I was always a dreamer and I talk to myself and I say, you know what, maybe the next race is your race, you know, um, it's going to be your race. And I knew in training, you know, the way I was training that, you know, I'm better than this guy and I'm better than that guy. And actually I trained with, prof with guys who were sponsored and I kicked their butts. I kicked their butts, you know, I just did not have my chance yet, you know, to, sh to prove that. I have it. So um, training, what you do in workout, gives you hope. It gives, it tells, you know, your training speaks for itself. So I, that's how I was talking to myself and pumping myself and, and staying positive and uh, always um, keeping hope that, you know, one day I will have my race. So that, and, and, and it's very sad because some guys who are very talented, that day never comes. I, that brings us to a good kind of closing on this right now is the idea of advice. And so we have a lot of students, student athletes, students who desire to be at that high elite professional level, as well as students who want to work with people, uh, work with athletes, you know, as like a trainer, a sports doctor, um, in those different capacities. So what advice would you give to a high school student now that either desires to be at that professional level as an athlete or to work directly with that kind of high-level client? Yeah. Uh, one advice that I will give um, to any, any athlete um, is that 
patience. You know, you just have to, you know, everything will, will always work for the best. You know, um, I think patience is very, very key to success. Um, also, uh, not, give, not giving up. And, um, you know, I, I personally, like, I'm going to um, just mention something. Um, you know, when I got sponsored by Nike, I, uh, I had a couple of my teammates in college reach out to me and they were so happy. They're like, Mo, uh, you're crazy. You know, like you stuck to it and you made it, you know, uh, because they all, had, they, all, they all had the same dream. They all had the same dream to become a professional runner. But everybody just got a normal job and they and they, they stopped running because they, they thought it was unrealistic. So my, my, my advice is you have to believe in yourself, believe in your, uh, your God-given talent, um, work hard. But give yourself some time to grow. Give yourself some time to learn the necessary skills. Give give yourself some time to make the mistakes. You know, a lot of people they, they want the results without making any mistakes. There's no way that you will become uh, whether uh, like a professional baseball player or football or soccer or any sport without making your mistakes. We all have to learn from our mistakes. And I became a good runner after I learned from many, 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 many mistakes. Years of making mistakes. Um, um, and also, uh, my advice, another advice that I would like to give for student athletes is to, uh, to work on their self-development, to work on their skills. Um, because uh, imagine if baseball doesn't work out or imagine if football doesn't work out. Well, make sure... You know, you, you you're great at communication. You're uh, you're good at something else, whether it's computers or make sure you have another skill, or coaching. Or be, if you if you love to stay in sports, well, you can be a professional athlete and also uh, start your uh, uh, let's say online fitness business, or you can start your uh, uh, your personal training. You know, you gotta have something on the side. Uh, to be honest, I I I mean, this is my. Uh, the number one advice is to balance have something on the side while you're uh, while you're fighting to fighting for your dream because without that something on the side you're gonna be stressed and you're gonna be scared and you're like i don't know what's gonna happen to me next year but if you have something on the side you know that you have that financial support i i'm 35 years old right now and i have you know I'm not going to talk about how much I make or and such and such, but I have so much financial support from my company. What I, you know, how much I make and and I have my assets and, and such. I wish I could run professionally right now. You know, yeah. I wish I could run right now because I know I can support myself uh, financially um, more than I more than like uh, 12, 13 years ago. Um, so, like I said. You know, be an entrepreneur, be a business, have that business business mentality. You know, while you're up trying to uh, to reach your uh, your dream. Mo, we know that MoFit is going on right now, and uh, you took your time out of your training schedules with your clients. So we want to thank you for joining us today and uh, taking us through your journey, and we really appreciate your time.